Well, hi guys, it's an honor to be here. It's really exciting for me. Um, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about myself and what I do. Uh, I've been working in the uh, film, television, and game industries for about 20 years now. I started off really young, I was very lucky. I started interning at a practical effects house when I was uh, 14 years old and we would do very low budget uh, directed TV movies. One of my first films, I was uh, fortunate enough to intern on a project called uh, Halloween Town. It came out a long time ago and uh, I swept floors, I helped the practical effects artists and uh, I learned a lot on that show and mainly I learned that originally that I, I, I wanted to do uh, sculpture and put actors in monster suits and that was really fun. While I was there I, I learned that I really just cared about design more than anything else and uh, that helped me to realize that. Uh, practical effects, I know you guys are studying a lot of stuff on the computer more towards uh, visual effects um, which I do also design for uh, but my career happened uh, in the beginning in the uh, practical world putting actors in monster suits, making puppets, and uh, doing a lot of like gore effects. Did a lot of horror back then. I still do horror, I love horror. Um, so I brought in several examples of what it's like designing in all three industries, film, television, and games. And I'm usually doing multiple jobs at the same time, and so I'm, I'm bouncing around quite a bit in all three industries. So I thought I'd show you guys some examples and what it's like, the similarities and the differences uh, between all three industries. So let's, let's start. Um, well, I'm primarily a designer of uh, creatures and superheroes. So I do a lot of superhero movies, I do a lot of monster shows, and uh, I've been teaching creature design for years, and so let's break that down a bit. Let's, let's look at what creature design actually is. Uh, so this was a creature that I did for a friend's book. Let's just go to full screen here. Let's see if I can expand this. Awesome. Okay. So this was a fun creature I did for just a friend's book. Um, and this was done in a program called ZBrush. I don't know if you guys are familiar with it, but it's, it's really just a sculpting program and it... Um, it really works well with the foundation that I have. I, I started off in clay, and so fortunately, there's a program out there that works just like clay. And the benefits to working in this program are, are pretty great. You can design fairly quickly, uh, you can show a concept at all angles, and once it's approved, it can actually be put into the pipeline of either growing it, uh, milling it out of foam, or it can be retopologized, cleaned up, and used as the actual asset in the film or the game or the, the TV show. So the benefits are really great and most of creature design is done uh, this way because monsters are so abstract. You know, it's not like going in and doing, you know, Batman, you know. You can work really hard on a bat suit, uh, but for the most part you know that uh, everyone's going to be on the same page. It's a guy in a onesie, he's got uh, the black cape and the cowl, you know, no surprises there. But a monster is completely bizarre and abstract. So how do we get here? Uh, so this was just the final image. This is the actual model. So this was done in ZBrush. There's a feature called Dynamesh, and you can actually pull all of this out of one sphere. So it's very much like clay. Before Dynamesh, you had to uh, build things very carefully and, and keep in mind the geometry and the density of the mesh uh, in areas where you needed the most detail. Now you can pretty much just reform it and clean it up later, which is incredible. So what is creature design? So after, after years of doing this for a living, I broke it down to creature design is the seamless blend of combining familiar elements, things that we're all familiar with. You'd think you could do anything as a creature designer, but there's a certain point where you reach with audiences where if elements of the design aren't recognizable, you've lost your audience. And so what I do for every job, whether it's a creature design, costume, character, even weapons, is I create a collage of reference. 
And that's step one before you ever start drawing, before you ever start sculpting. You figure out what your game plan is. I used to have to go to the library, don't have to do that now. I can do this all on Google. And I'll, I'll look up bizarre animals and, and see how I can combine them in new and exciting ways. So you can see that with the creature, you know, you've got a bit of elephant seal and the red crest on the head. You've got obviously the tentacles from the skin, uh, the squid, and the uh, elephant texture all throughout the body. And I also like to research things that we don't see that often, like microscopic organisms. These over here, these little guys, are dust mites. And what's really fascinating is you can find some very bizarre things just within our world. And because we're familiar with those shapes, we accept the creature design. And so I'll often present with a uh, turntable to clients um, just so that they can see it at all angles. Uh, before ZBrush, before working in 3D, uh, it was very common to do something called a maquette in practical effects houses. So I would do a bunch of sketches and then uh, I would do a quick clay sculpt to show clients in the presentation what this creature could actually look like. Now everything is in the computer and it's, it's really fun and it's, it's really fast. And as I've said, this is, this is how it all starts. Um, you can see everything from vultures, frogs, animals that navigate weird terrain, really weird textures, just anything I can find. And because the audience has to have an emotional reaction to the character, I've also added humans. And so I want, I want the creature to have a lot of personality. I want to make a character. And so it starts with just loose, sketches. So this is done ballpoint pen, very small sketch pad, and I'm just brainstorming. I'm looking at my reference and I'm just doodling. These drawings are for me. They don't have to be amazing. They just have to get the idea uh, across. They just have to get me there. And so then I refine, and as you can see, very small sketch pad. I did this doodle. I started off by doing a light underdrawing with a gray marker and then outlined it in a ballpoint pen. From there, I brought it into Photoshop and I bumped up the contrast so it was just a drawing against a white page and then I treated Photoshop like a marker set and I just resolved it in grayscale, added a few highlights. This is my game plan before going into 3D. And then we block it out. So this was blocked out in ZBrush in very low geometry. And when sculpting in ZBrush, you want to work from low to high geometry. So this is super low, and uh, it's probably about 3,000 polygons. And um, at this stage, you don't move forward unless the character is there, unless it already looks like that sketch. It has to resemble the character. And I learned that from traditionally sculpting. The rule when working with clay is you rough out the entire design with your hands and before you ever pick up a tool you set that either maquette small sculpture or you know maybe it's a mask or whatever you set that across the room you look at it and it has to look finished before you pick up a tool and refine it so the same thing can be applied to working in 3d so now at this point i start to up res and i start to work out and resolve the head you can see i'm figuring out not only the secondary form, but tertiary forms. I'm adding pores, wrinkles, and I'm trying to nail the character of that face before I spend a lot of time on the body. I want it to live here. There's a saying that you can actually design a creature from the head down. The reason for that is because all of the patterns, all of the textures, everything that you do in the face will repeat itself through the body in order to make a cohesive design. Same thing with you know, a suit of armor, for example, if you were designing a helmet, all of those patterns to create a cohesive suit of armor would end up showing up throughout the rest of the body. The system in which the thing's built, you'd see, you know, armor here, armor here, rivets here, rivets here, and it just continues. So those rules apply to almost everything, including props, vehicles, and there he is. He's all fleshed out, he's sculpted, fun stuff, and now texture, paint. And this is taken as far uh, as I could in ZBrush, the initial program. So it still kind of looks like a toy. It doesn't have a very strong renderer. 
but it's not bad. Here's a turntable. So just posing him a little bit just brings him to life. And that's really exciting because to get to this stage, it, it takes a while and you're working symmetrically with the character because you can detail one side and it mirrors. But when it's moving, when, it, when it's when it's posed, you can really get a feel uh, for the character. Wow. Yeah, it's a fun one. Close up, why not? So you can see the face, you can see elements of the vulture, you don't really, this guy looks creepy, and it all reads because it's grounded in the reference, in the photos that I, that I gathered, and I found a way to combine all of those elements convincingly. Here it is rendered out in uh, Keyshot. So this is a more sophisticated renderer. It's not as high res, but you can see the lighting is more realistic, and therefore the character feels more realistic. I'm now better at rendering, this is a little jerky, um, but uh, you can see it feels pretty realistic. So in ZBrush, you saw that first level where uh, there were all those colors and it was low geometry, right? So you divide that, and every time you hit divide, you increase the density of the model uh, by four. So it was originally at 3,000, I hit divide, now I have 12, that took a while, uh, 12,000 uh, polygons to work with instead of 3,000, and in those 12,000, I can take the detail further, and I can divide it again and again and again. The cool thing about this is that I can slide the division all the way back to the first division, and I can pose that, so I can pose the model at its lowest density, and everything moves very evenly, so you don't have to rig unless you wanted to animate it. Or let's say I have to do a keyframe, a, a scene from the movie where there are like hundreds of these things. If that happens, then I would rig it using um, what's called Z spheres in uh, ZBrush, and I'd be able to move it very quickly, save out one, move another one, and just pose it in an environment uh, as quickly as possible. But for one character, not necessary, which is uh, a tremendous relief. So these were the final images that I would then present to the client. So now it's just a matter of hitting render and then adding atmosphere and effects, particulates in the air, adjusting the lighting in Photoshop. And so I would do this at multiple angles. There is back view. And then close up on the head, because again, we want to sell like a creepy scavenger vulture. You know, so that's, that's the point of that process. And as I mentioned before, a lot of this starts in 2D. And um, as I also mentioned, I don't like uh, teaching 3D to beginning students because uh, 3D is actually a lot easier than drawing and painting. Same thing can be said uh, in regards to sculpture. And it seems a little odd to say that, but it's a matter of what you're actually tackling when you're working. For example, um, when I open up a bag of clay, I have dimension, I have form, I have lighting. It's already there. And so the job becomes, in layman's terms, or, or uh, uh, not, not, to, not to demean it, but uh, the job becomes to push that form around in a convincing way. Whereas, if you have a blank page, you are absolutely responsible for creating the illusion of all of that light, form, dimension, and it's all on you. So it is actually a bit more challenging, and it takes a lot longer uh, to learn how to draw well than it does to sculpt well. Um, so I want to show just a little bit of that process. So I drew this on an airplane on my honeymoon, actually. It was a long flight, and I bought a sketchbook, and I just started doodling. As a concept artist, and uh, with a lot of jobs in these industries, you realize that it's not just a job, it's not just a career, it's actually a lifestyle. And I love doing this whenever I, whenever I can. This is the most fun for me. I have more fun doing this than playing video games and you know doing other things. So it helps you build up that mileage. So this guy stuck with me for a bit and I wanted to resolve him. So I scanned him into Photoshop, and look at the steps. Let's see if I can just go full screen here for a second. There it is. So I brought the drawing in, 
and in Photoshop I painted the rest of him out in grayscale and I just blocked him out in a few values. Now values meaning varying tones of, of gray to black and I blocked it out that way. Then I added another layer where I started to introduce color and that's just a color layer in Photoshop. And then from there I selected the palette, the colors, the values, everything I needed and I created a new layer and I just painted on top of it to finish. So you can see when we really zoom in, that's just loose paint strokes. And this, this is actually more exciting to me nowadays than figuring out every single uh, pore on a character. This is when I have uh, the most fun. You can still see the loose sketch right there in the face. So that's all the pencil work, that's all of it. And so the process uh, continues and it's, it's really fun. These are um, demos from my classes and so I've, I've retired recently from teaching. I'll probably go back to it um, when my schedule gets a little bit less chaotic. Uh, but in this <coughs> class, what I was doing was I was having students design three alien bounty hunters. <coughs> and um, we created a collage, and the bounty hunters had to have costumes, and they had to uh, have animals as part of their anatomy. They had to you know, uh, have that blend of human and animal anatomy. And so I'm just concepting and I'm working in grayscale and I'm just blocking out really fun shapes, always working from reference. And again, the same process. So I took my pit bull character and I want to sculpt this guy. I want to make him really cool one day if my schedule ever allows for him. Uh, and I drew on top of it. You see, I organized the design stained it with color, using color layer, same technique as the previous image, and then started to paint opaquely on top of it. And there he is. Uh, this is a lot faster than modeling out an entire character in 3D. And so much of the design process in these industries is about initially showing a lot of options. And so you have to be pretty flexible, and these techniques enable you to do that. You can start with a very simple drawing and then bring it into Photoshop and sell it. So the, all of these techniques are basically the same thing. Uh, this was just a fraction of the design was actually resolved up here. And as you can see, I resolved it in grayscale, stained with color. Love working in 2D. It's much faster. Now the issue is that most clients, this isn't enough. And it, I understand, you know, if you're working with a director and you show him this. He's blocking out shots in his head. He's trying to imagine how to reveal this creature, how, how this creature works in his scene. He he's, needs to see everything. He needs to see pores, sweat, saliva, whatever. And so from this stage, jumping into 3D and taking it as far as the rock rubber piece is what nowadays gets the design approved. So the technology has changed quite a bit and you have to evolve uh, with that industry. Uh, it's moving. It moves constantly. But I love drawing, and it's always the start of things. So let's look at some actual projects. Um, let's talk about film, and I brought in a few examples of movies that I've worked on in the past. Um, Batman vs. Superman, let's bring this up. Uh, I think I organized these files. I got to work on Batman. Nice. Which was really fun. It was a goal of mine for a long time. I always wanted to do a bat suit, and uh, this was a great opportunity. I worked with a very talented costume designer and an amazing team of artists, and uh, there were a lot of characters to work on. I bounced around on um, Wonder Woman and Aquaman, but I spent most of my time getting this guy right. And this was a uh, wonderful process. Uh, I've done, I've worked on four bat suits now, and um, it was it was an honor to work on uh, this character because it was so different this time, and it was uh, it was pretty exciting. Um, so before before I started on uh, Avengers, I was doing Justice League, and uh, I was in London for a while. So a lot of that work uh, is starting to come out now. But this is this is how it started. So this was actually a combination of a lot of techniques. And I did this a couple of years ago, and I, don't, I didn't know 3D as well as I know it now. So a lot of it was painted on top of 
very rough sculptures that I had done. Very rough. I think I brought a few examples of how rough they were. So I'm working on this character while the entire machine is, is moving. Uh, so not only are they refining the script, but they're actually looking for an actor. So you'll notice not all of these actually look like Ben Affleck. When I started doing it, we were doing different actors. There were different actors that were in mind. For the most part, it was, it was always Ben for the most part. But before we knew that, I was, I was work looking at other actors. I was looking at uh, John Hamm, for example, because it was going to be a, uh, an older Batman this time around. And so I ended up doing an amalgam of John Hamm and, and other, uh, adjusting it a little bit just in case it didn't get approved because I wanted the images to still last. Uh, oftentimes when I'm on these projects, actors will be considered for the role and so we're designing uh, around the actor's likeness. And then when uh, that doesn't work out, whether it's a schedule thing or the actor doesn't want to do it anymore, we have to swap out the faces constantly. And it's a little harder with this because there's an entire cowl around that head, and the head changes. And you can see just a big dude, you know, as he appeared in the comics, specifically Frank Miller. Uh, there were some additions to, you know, bring it into the uh, cinematic world, but had to figure it out at all angles. You know, it's a very um, meticulous process, resolving boots and the cowl and, and the, the onesie. <laughs> took forever. Here are some call-outs that uh, oh, I ended yeah. up doing, trying to figure out, you know, the musculature and the body and, and just the fabric pattern. And so it was uh, my first major costume show. I'll do concepts for costumes in on projects, but to work with the actual costume designer and to get this specific was, was very exciting. And it's a complicated process. Here, doing quick paintings of the initial reveal of Batman uh, in the film. Um, trying to figure out what he looks like up in a corner somewhere. Uh, just super loose, and I, I just love jumping around. We never got to do the closed cape yet. I uh, hope we get to. That's, that's my favorite. Uh, I grew up watching the Batman animated series. That was everything to me. So to be able to just show the character, ah, and here's the model. So you can see, this was actually done pretty quickly, and there's a ton of paint over it. You know, you'll notice that those lines aren't the same, uh, the cowl isn't the same. These were earlier versions as well. You can see a little bit of the other actor in there showing battle damage, stuff like that. And these images are on the bonus features. You can see a little bit of John Hamm in that, but I didn't want the exact likeness because I didn't, I didn't know if he was going to get cast. So, you know, just sculpting wrinkles in fabric and trying to figure out how to build that, that suit. You can see different cowl options. There's panel breakup back here that we were playing around with, different logos. We ended up bulking him out even more than this. So I ended up doing tons of these. This was the first uh, sketch for the Batman mech suit. I got to do this. Oh, sweet. Really fun. Just grayscale. Just how I was able to do the other images super fast because it takes forever to model stuff like this out in 3D hard surface modeling. And then again, call outs once the suit was refined. And even if you look at this concept, the final was even adjusted. So it's constantly being adjusted because this was actually built practically. And so they were, they were refining the design in the practical effects house. I just had to create an image that was really like a talking point, you know, a starting point. And this is what I started off with. So it just blocked out some basic shapes. And uh, most of it was actually resolved in Photoshop. And so this is as far as I took it. And then I had to jump back on to uh, the actual bat suit. And then a very good friend of mine ended up refining it with the costume designer. It just went back and forth. I've been very fortunate to work with a lot of insanely talented people. And every job is an opportunity to learn. And it's, it's always exciting, always humbling. Uh, let's look at Guardians of the Galaxy. And I think I have too much images. Uh, so one of the main things I did on Guardians of the Galaxy, this was my first time working with Marvel, um, was the Sakaran soldiers. 
And so these were early, early options for them. And uh, in this process, we're trying to figure out, is it a guy in a suit? Is it a guy in a costume? Or is it a CG character, computer generated character? And uh, there are actually going to be classes, a hierarchy. You've got your basic soldier right here. You've got your berserker, your big guy who would just kind of run in and start tearing things apart. And then maybe you have your general, these basic silhouettes of just the head and shoulders, and you can kind of tell where they would fit in an army. You know, this guy, you know, he's so delicate, he has all of these, these pieces that are almost ornate. He's obviously not running in and punching and, and, and fighting, uh, doing any hand-to-hand. -hand. He's calling the shots. Uh, this guy's probably shooting, he's, he's um, able to run around, but this dude looks like a football player. So he's running in, he's tackling, he's smashing. And, you know, this is where the entire process started. Um, so the way that it usually works on a production is one of two ways. Uh, one, assignments are just given out to the different artists. Or two, they want a ton of options. And so the same design, the same assignment is given to multiple artists. And then someone nails it or someone gets close and then that one artist stays with that assignment and the other artists move on. And so this happened with the soldiers. In all honesty, working with Marvel for the first time was pretty intimidating. Like, they are the best of the best. There are guys there that every time I go back, I learn from, and they're just insanely, insanely talented. So when I heard that there was going to be, like, an undead evil army, I, I jumped at it because it's like, okay, I can do that. Not a problem. Uh, this, was, this was a couple of years uh, before I ended up doing Batman and other superheroes. And so I didn't feel very confident uh, with anything except, you know, the scary stuff. So this actually uh, got me the characters, and then I started dressing it. So if you look at maybe some of the bonus features, or uh, there's one shot where he's actually talking, where he's got a, a face like this. And then going into ZBrush, and I had to work with a costume designer on this, and showing the costume at all angles. How was it going to be built? Were we going to grow pieces? A lot of it had to be fabric, because these were essentially stormtroopers. And when you're putting costumes on like 50 extras, you have to be able to build them quickly, efficiently, and one size has to fit all for the most part. So how do you make these pieces? And so I was playing around with all of those different patterns and materials, and again showing it at all angles. First time I ever did it for an actual character. So you can see there are bug shells. This was like a meteor rock thing. Helmets, just tons and tons of helmets. And there he is, for the most part, and I'll show you the final. So here's a turntable okay, of the bad. final model for it. And from here, oh, this was done in key shot, so you'll notice the materials are a little cooler. And then these are the final images. So you can see very resolved, full suit. And so, believe it or not, this took months to do. And when I wasn't doing that, I was on background aliens, constantly waiting for, for feedback. And again, it's the same process. You'll notice there's a wide range of techniques, and all of that really depends on what your client needs to make a good choice. I've worked with clients that just need drawings. They don't need anything this resolved uh, to start the design process. Other clients, every single thing has to be photorealistic. This guy's actually in the movie. If you, if you don't blink, you'll see him. And we had to just come up with a lot of options. So I, was, I would actually Google weird animal, and uh, I'd look at an image search, and then I'd just start sketching. These were options for the rat. Just a weird, creepy rat. Fun, fun stuff. Uh, let's see, what else? Ooh, Spider-Man. Uh, so this was early... Early oh, lizard. Early lizard. So you can see some of the shapes still ended up in there. That's a problem with uh, doing visual effects characters. There are a lot of artists involved in the process. Uh, if you're lucky, you can kind of see your uh, two cents on screen. Um, but a lot of talented people. It's really just an honor to be a part of it. Different options for the lizard. And these were all started in um, ZBrush and painted over. This was a long time ago. So I even had like photos of scales in there, but for the most part, it's in 3D. Uh, this was uh, Amazing Spider-Man 2 suits. Figured that out in 2D with a wonderful studio called uh, Ironhead. So I was generating images, trying to 
get the suit approved so that they could actually build it. I tried a few things to tech out the suit, make it interesting. The first suit in that series was really pushed, really bizarre, and so I was trying to bring those pushed elements into a more classic suit, but fortunately they just went with something right out of the comic, which most audiences really appreciate. And as a comic book geek myself, when they want to go with the source material, I'm always happy, because I actually worked on the first amazing Spider-Man suit, and it was so far and it was so pushed uh, that I don't think audiences responded well to it. So web shooters, uh, concepts for, you know, the new web shooter, what does that look like? How does it load? Um, I wanted it to load up almost like a shotgun shell. Uh, oh, sweet. Yeah, so it just clicks in and, and uh, he can eject cartridges or whatever. There was even an idea for having him able to play music through the cowl. <laughs> so you can see just a little hint of like an MP3 player there. So I don't know if he was going to be web slinging with Iron Maiden or I don't know what he was <laughs> doing exactly. But, you know, just generating images, trying to uh, help the process. Sometimes, here's an example of a design that didn't get through. So I worked on X-Men Apocalypse. Uh, I was working on that film while uh, working in-house at Marvel, and they just needed me to help generate some ideas. They had their inside team, and um, they had ideas for Apocalypse that I was, I, I was just ecstatic um, to jump on. Uh, so originally, Apocalypse was going to look kind of like Apocalypse. The reason they didn't go with that um, is because of rewrites to the script and this no longer fit in their film. So I always, I always love to do something that looks like the source material. And when I was a kid, actually, weird how life unfolds sometimes, uh, I was uh, an insomniac. And uh, in order to help myself go to sleep, I would actually cast and put actors in cinematic versions of these comic book characters that I loved. And so when I was a kid, I was always imagining Lawrence Fishburne as Apocalypse in the suit, his amazing voice and everything. And so I've been thinking about this forever, so just to have the opportunity to do it was uh, exciting for me. Let's see, I think I have... Oh yeah, so here was the actual model that I built. Uh, so that's it at every angle. Again, if the suit was resolved, I'd have to answer every every question so that it could get built. And this is enough information, too, to work with the people who are going to build the suit and the costume designer. She can, or he can tweak things, and they can just figure out whether or not they can put an actor in this. Let's do video games. So, the last video game that I did was Gears of War. So the first thing I did for Gears of War was the uh, Pouncer. And the Pouncer started off all over the place. Now, in video games, you draw constantly, uh, which I really love. It's a 2D process for a very long time because we gotta figure out what the look is of these characters, and they have a lot more time than a film does to answer those problems, to find those solutions. And so these sketches really range um, and are completely different from what ended up. This was actually one of my favorites. So it's just grayscale monsters. and. I would start with a little doodle, about yay big, a couple of inches, and I'd scan that into the computer, resolve it in grayscale, get a yay or nay from the client. Does this work? Do they like pieces of it? And so I'll do sometimes 50 sketches, at least this resolved, um, before moving into 3D. And you have to think about a lot when doing these designs. One issue is, of course, gameplay. How is the player interacting with this thing? What does this thing do? All of them have to jump. So I'm looking at animals that jump, obviously. And they all have to look intimidating. They all have to be beefy. They have to be, it has to be that Gears of War chunky universe. And that, that took me a while to get used to. Here are some other options. Just a weird, creepy little head but chunky, and pit bulls are really chunky, and there's a scene, so it does a few things. It jumps, and then it lands on top of players, and its face takes up the entire screen, and it's just like chewing at you, <laughs> constantly. Oh. And its tongues are coming out and, and hitting you. Um, and so knowing gameplay, you can, you can design around that. What does it do? That's, that's huge. And so then I started building the asset in 3D. I started finding the form. So there's scorpion, pit bull in there, the weird tongues are squiddy. 
Like, it's a blast. And um, I was able to get all the materials. You can see the weird tongue. And of course, because he's going to be in your face, you got to resolve that face. Has anybody seen American Horror Story? Oh, yeah. I have. All right, we'll do that then. All right. I love that show. So no, I, did, I did the first two seasons. So I did Bloody Face, The Alien, The Raspers, and this was some of the most fun uh, I had on a show. Um, so the difference for TV oh, is that, and sorry, yeah, he's creepy as hell. Uh, I apologize. Uh, the difference in designing for TV is that it's faster. There aren't as many sketches. Everything has to be resolved because we have to build, we have to get it on set as soon as possible. So every option that I did for this character looked at least this resolved, and then this had to be matched. This was one of the shows where the owner of the effects house was on set and he actually needed me to come in and make sure that the artists were matching uh, the concept art. So it was, it was very exciting to, again, work with amazingly talented people and, and learn. Let's see what else we got. Ah, oh, this was from the first season. Oh, God. Yeah, that's Infantata, what they were calling it. They called it something else, too. It's like a Frankenstein. And so this was really uh, bizarre, because what we were looking for was a little person uh, that actually fit a certain dimension. And so I actually had to build this in 3D while they were trying to find an actor that could fit inside this thing. And I had to adjust the design to match his likeness. But yeah, they found a guy, I forgot how, a very small person. He was in Freak Show as well. I think he played Meep in, in Freak, Freak Show. And he didn't have much makeup on in that. But that was, that was really fun. So I take it this far, they approve it, and then the practical effects house has to take plaster casts of the actor and then sculpt the makeup and figure out the fingers and everything on top of their body so that they can create these pieces that they'll glue onto his face and transform the actor into the character. Really fun stuff. These were raspers from season two Asylum. So these were the experiments. And I did tons of these trying to figure them out. And they're really gooey and creepy. Ah, this was an early alien concept. So you never really see the alien for that long in uh, Asylum. But we were going to do a full animatronic puppet, which is really exciting. And uh, unfortunately, they only shot its head. But Aww. this was an option. But because it was a full puppet, I had to figure it out again at all angles. Just like the bat suit, there were a lot of things that had to be resolved and had to be answered. And so this was the best way to do it. This was the final that they ended up using, so I sculpted this in ZBrush. Uh, I gave this to the visual effects department, but it was going so fast, the project was going so fast that sculptors in the practical effects house had to take these images and do it in clay because there was no time to just take the model and mill it out in foam. It was a crazy, crazy fun show. Uh, this was another early head option. And this is what they went with. This was actually done in Photoshop. Oh my god. <laughs> and so I had to, once this was approved, I actually had to sculpt it in 3D. And there it is. And you only see it for a second. Hours, wow. hours, days of work. And that happens sometimes. Okay, so that's film, television, and video games. I got it covered. Thank you for having me, Actors for Autism. Your question.